Anyway, welcome to Bimmy's first Tuesday talk of 2023. Res Yay! <laughs> that was so nice of you to say that. Makes my heart feel good. Anyway, um, we're so glad you're here. My name is George Davis. It's my pleasure as a member of the BIMI board uh, to help put these on every year. I've got a lot of assistance from people, uh, so it makes it a lot of fun for me. Uh, I, I, first, I need to start by telling you BIMI's mission, which is to provide educational experiences and hands-on exploration to inspire appreciation of the extraordinary saltwater environment around Block Island. Our Tuesday talks represent one of those educational experiences and are free of charge, as is admission to our aquarium. We have now five tanks out there, or is it six? It's five, right? Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> I would like you to do this next time. So there's two touch tanks, three tanks with fish. Uh, as of this afternoon, one had a blue fish, one had, well, several blue fish. One was full of blues, one was full of dogfish, and the other was full of squid. And then there's the touch tanks with crabs and, and a lot of other urchins probably. And what else, Valerie? Crabs and things kids love. Anyway, um, the, it's, it's free to come to Bimmy and see our aquariums. And most of our programs are free, just as the talks are free. So if you, if you think or you're supportive of our mission, please consider a donation either tonight or online. That would be very well appreciated. And if you want to save time at the door, please register online. Valerie told me to say that. It's, it doesn't always work perfectly, but please, and if it doesn't work when you try to register, let us know. Websites are notoriously finicky, and ours seems to be finicky as well. And I should, and I don't want to miss out on giving an acknowledgement to Jesse Ranowski and Deadeye Dix, who once again this year is providing wonderful pre-talk meals for the speaker. It, it really makes a heck of a difference. <laughs> Tonight, we have a special friend of Block Island and of Bimmy, Sarah Callen, who has also been on two guys, the two guys on the block podcast. So that's really what makes her famous. What? Um, oh, I'm out of the camera. That's that was really by design, you know, anyway. Uh, so she's been on two guys and she's been out to Block Island many times and involved in seal rescues. And some of you in the audience I know have been helping her with that as well. Sarah is the manager of animal rescue for Mystic Aquarium, and she will be speaking tonight on Southern New England seals and marine mammal rescue. Please welcome Sarah Callen. Thank you all. Can everyone hear me okay? I have my Britney Spears mic tonight, we were all saying. So um, I've never used one of these before, so hopefully it works well. Um, well, thank you all for being here. And thank you, George and Val and Chris and Maura and everybody for hosting me. And we have our interns here as well. So um, I appreciate everything that you guys do for us um, and for all the animals on Black Island. Like they said, my name is Sarah. I manage our animal rescue program at the aquarium, and we have about 300 volunteers with our program. Some of our volunteers are sitting here tonight. Um, Barb and <clears throat> Val and everyone, thank you guys for um, all you guys do on responses. Um, we couldn't do it without them. We have two full-time staff with our program. Um, we have a uh, Part, two part-time staff, and other than that, it's all volunteer-based. And so all of the success with our program is really um, in tribute to all of our volunteers and our interns with our program. I, for anyone who's younger here, I get a lot of questions about how um, you get in a career and how you kind of work your way into this field. So I'll give a very brief um, introduction on how I got into this field because it is not a traditional method at all. Um, I actually have a degree in psychology. Um, I uh, was really focused on animal behavior, 
in school. And so once I graduated, I thought I actually wanted to be a teacher. I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. So what did I do? I actually packed up my surfboard and my hockey bag and I moved to Australia for a year because why not? Um, but when I got to Australia, I um, played hockey there for a year, but then I also just wanted to get involved in as much as I could in terms of animal care and get my foot in the door that way. So while I was there, I did volunteer at Crumbin Wildlife Sanctuary where I got to work with um, a lot of native species. They were all rescue species that had either burned in fires and um, had a lot of other natural illnesses. So it was a really great way for me to learn about the medical side of the field um, and what rehabilitation really entailed. And then um, because Australia was amazing and once I came back to Connecticut, I was a little um, sad to not be in a beautiful paradise. So I took an internship in Hawaii. Um, I was supposed to be there for three months and five years later, I was still there, but I um, did an internship with endangered Hawaiian monk seals out there, which led to various jobs as an aquarist and um, also working with National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration while I was out there. I volunteered at the zoo. So really just taking any opportunity that came my way. It might not have been my ultimate dream job, but it was something that I always tell my, you know, interns or volunteers, no matter what job you take, if it's not your dream job, you're still going to learn something. You're going to learn if you want to continue with this career path or alter it in some way. So there's no real bad opportunity in my opinion. And I got to work with endangered species. And the opportunity that I got through some of these volunteer positions I had is what really changed my career path and is why I'm in the position I am today. And it's because of this opportunity I had where I went to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands in Hawaii. I lived for four months on this little island right there called Laysan Island. So it's near Midway Atoll. Um, it's uninhabited. There's really no vegetation. There was one tree on the island. It's about three miles long by a mile wide. And I went out there for four months with NOAA's Hawaiian Monk Seal Health and Disease Program. So we took a big research vessel out there. I lived with these two people on this island in tents. All of our gear that we brought out there was in buckets, and we had to freeze anything for 48 hours. We couldn't bring perishable items, um, no cardboard because mold could grow on it. So everything was really quarantined. My job was to survey the seal population, um, tag any weaned pups, take samples, monitor behavior for a research study. Um, but what ended up being my job, which was what surprised me, was disentanglements and um, just kind of dealing with this every day. I was in absolute paradise, but we were living in trash. And it wasn't trash just from the Hawaiian Islands. It was trash from all over the world. And so we were in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is about six times the size of Texas. And so as far deep as you can dig in the sand, there were things that we use every single day in our lives. There were bottles, there were toothbrushes, there were lighters, um, you name it. We had bigger items as well, like laundry baskets, um, straws. I mean, anything that you can think of that's plastic that we use every single day was on this island. And so what my job ended up being was more the disentanglement side of things. Um, there were albatross that, these are all albatross chicks from the island and um, only 80% of them, um, sorry, 80% of them don't survive. And this is what their stomachs look like. This is the albatross stomach. So you can see bottle caps, um, any piece of plastic that is ever created is never gonna go away. It's gonna break down into those microplastics and that's what these animals ingest. Um, so this is the experience. I was blown away. You hear about these things, you see it on you know, documentaries and stuff like that. But I think until you really see it firsthand and you're living in it and you can't get away from it, there was nowhere to take it, there was nowhere to go. That's where I was like, okay, I need to go back and share this and have a platform where I can help educate the public and try to make a difference and really be the voice for these animals. And so that's why I took this job at Mystic Aquarium. And our mission there is to inspire people to inspire people to care for and protect our ocean planet through conservation, education, and research. And so that's one thing that I really feel like, especially our animal rescue program embodies in every single thing that we do, um, from rescuing animals, from outreaching and working with the public. And really our job and our responsibility is to share the stories of these animals and be the voice for them. 
um, and tell people what's going on in their environment and the threats that they face. So a little bit about our program, for those of you who don't know. Um, our animal rescue program, not only, yes, we're located in Connecticut, we cover the whole Connecticut shoreline, but we also cover all of Rhode Island, and then Fishers Island, New York as well, so it's about 1,000 miles of coastline. We respond to any live or deceased marine mammal or sea turtle. So that's any dolphin, whale, seal, sea turtle. And then we have a 24-hour hotline, which is always a treat, whoever has the hotline. We get calls at 4 in the morning about seals on the road from police officers. The hotline really dictates our day, so we don't really have a, an 8 to 5 schedule. It's really just dictated by the hotline. And of course, everyone loves to go out to the beach at sunset, which is usually after 5 o'clock. So that's why we're often on the beach um, very late at night. But our stranding program is part of a region, and it's called the Greater Atlantic Region. And so that extends from Maine all the way down to Virginia. And so we have a bunch of stranding organizations within our region that we work with very closely on a regular basis. Every stranding organization has to apply for a stranding agreement, and that's what authorizes us to be able to even put hands on an animal approach an animal and get close to them, it's through the stranding agreement. And there's three articles that you can apply for in a stranding agreement. It's response to live animals, dead animals, and do rehabilitation. And every organization can decide what they want to apply for. We apply for all three, but we're one of the only organizations locally in our network that does the rehabilitation. So a lot of times, yes, we get in animals from our coverage area, but we also get a lot of animals in from outside of our organization as well, um, from organizations that maybe don't do rehab and they just do the response side of things. So sometimes we have a very full clinic uh, for that reason. And today I'm going to be focusing mostly on SEALs, but just to give you a little insight about different types of responses that we do. We'll do live dolphin responses, which are always very difficult cases. In Cape Cod, they typically see mass stranding, so a lot of healthy animals, and it's because of the difference in the tide. They have really drastic tides. They have a lot of sandbars, so animals come into shore at high tide, and then the tide goes out, and then they're left stranded on a sandbar. Here, we primarily see single stranded animals, and that's because they're very sick. So any live dolphin stranding we go on, we're going to bring a veterinarian and do a full workup on that animal. Um, external exam, we draw blood, we have a little machine that we can analyze the blood in the field. So we can make a really um, good decision in the field about what's the best quality of life for this animal and if they're a good rehabilitation candidate. We also, on the top right, deal with uninhabited um, or not um, species that aren't natural to our habitat out here. So that would be like this manatee. This is Washburn. She Initially was stranded in Cape Cod in 2016, I think. Um, and so that was an animal that's out of habitat. We, our stranding agreement doesn't permit us to respond to manatees, so we had to get an emergency permit through, through um, United States Fish and Wildlife Service because they have jurisdiction over manatees in order for us to even get hands on this animal. So we let her, we had three weeks where we monitored her. We gave her every chance to get back down south on her own, but there was a cold front that was going to hit, so we knew that we had to rescue her or else she didn't have a very good chance of survival. Um, she was actually released a year, uh, sorry, not a year, a month and a half later. We found out she was pregnant, which was really cool. She had a six-month-old um, fetus in her, and she was the only manatee that's ever been tagged to go from Florida straight to the Bahamas. So we joked. She knew what she was doing. She got a free flight down to Florida. And then she's like, OK, I know what I'm doing. I'm going right to the Bahamas. So she was a fun case for us. And then we also have our large whale strandings. These are very complex. Um, a lot of times, these whales wash up in areas that are very um, inopportune, like someone's backyard um, and areas that you would probably want a pretty speedy removal for, but on average, it probably takes about two to three days to even get the logistics together for what has to go into a whale necropsy like that. Um, our preferred and um, most effective method of disposal for large whales is to bury them. And um, otherwise, people always ask if you sink them, if you tow them out to sea, they're gonna end up right back on shore. Um, we've definitely had that happen multiple times, burying them. You wouldn't even know the whale's there, and the little critters in the sand are going to take care of it very easily. 
but that's um, a big undertaking doing a whale necropsy and requires a lot of resources. But great information from it, especially because a lot of the whales we respond to um, are listed under unusual mortality events, so there's a high mortality in a very short period of time of, of those animals. All right, so here's a quick glance at our marine mammal responses per year. I will say the 2023 year to date was from like April, so I haven't had a chance to update those numbers, but just to give you an idea of the past couple of years, most of our responses are in Block, or in Rhode Island, and actually 25% of all of our responses are in Block Island, which is a pretty significant number. Um, the logistics for coming out here for a lot of those cases can be challenging, which is why our first responders are so important to us and we appreciate them so much because it does put a lot on them on island. Um, it's a lot of walking to the North Lake. It's a lot of um, going in the field on very cold days. Um, so we appreciate them very much, but it's all great data that we get because every animal that we, we respond to is going to tell us something about the environment they're coming from, um, why they might have passed or why they stranded. Um, so really great data and information that we collect from every single animal. And this doesn't even show hotline calls. I can tell you last year alone we had 430 hotline calls. Um, I can't remember the number from Block Island, but it's a significant number from Block Island. So just because we have one animal strand, usually we'll get multiple, multiple calls from that one animal. So that pulls a lot of our resources as well. Of course, yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So in 2019, we actually had an unusual mortality event for seals. Uh, it was determined that it was focusing this temper virus. So we um, had an exponential increase in all of our seal strandings that year. And throughout our whole network, actually, our team went up to Maine. Uh, on average, I'd say like Maine probably has about 100 or so seal strandings per year. And in the month of July alone, they had around 700. Um, so it was a significant amount, especially up north. So we sent our crew up there to try to help them. And then it slowly trickled its way down here. So it can show how and why our research that we're doing is so important because, you know, one one thing like a disease like focusing this temper virus can wipe out a, a pretty significant amount of the population as well. And that's all it'll take. And especially in, with animals like in Hawaii, we dealt with this a lot. There's only about 1,400 Hawaiian monk seals left and you have something like that, it can wipe out the entire population. So very important um, and great information that we can gather from stuff like that. But yeah, that was a good question. Um, so seals, that's what we're gonna talk about primarily today. There's four species of seals that we'll see um, in this area, we have our gray seals, probably one of the more common species you guys see on island here. Uh, probably the most common species we see in our coverage area as a whole. Gray seals, for whatever reason, seem to be mostly on the beaches, on shore. Our harbor seals hang out a lot on rocks offshore. Um, gray seals pup in January, um, so we'll see them a lot, of, a lot of pups in the wintertime. Harbor seals pup up north in the summertime, so we don't see a lot of harbor seal pups up here. Well, you will see those really fluffy white gray seal pups. Um, they'll lose that, we call it lanugo coat, after a couple weeks, three to four weeks, and that's when they're weaned. Mom will stay with them and not eat while she's nursing them. Um, and then eventually after three to four weeks, when mom's lost a lot of weight, she's very hungry, she's gonna go back and look for food on her own. Harp seals, so these guys are interesting. Um, they come down from the Arctic. Um, we've actually, we released a harp seal once within 10 days, it was in Greenland, so they travel very far distances in short periods of time. Um, they'll be seen in our area from about January till April, and these are ice seals. They're used to being on ice, um, they're used to being on snow, and because it's so cold where they're from, they actually have to eat snow and ice to get extra hydration because the air is so dry and cold. Well, think about when they come down here. Do we have ice packs, especially this past winter? Um, we don't really have a lot of snow, but they're used to eating the substrate they're on, so they're eating sand and rocks. So we're seeing a lot of harp seals strand because they have uh, rock impaction in their stomach, and we've definitely done surgeries. We pull out about three to four pounds of rocks, typically from a harp seal's stomach. So um, that's one effect of climate change that's having on that specific population. In addition, the ice packs are melting, so the larger animals are pushing the younger animals off the ice, pack, ice packs because they're competing for that limited space. So we're seeing a lot of the juveniles, which is what this um, picture shows, harp seals. And you'll see their flippers are a little different. Um, they actually grip. So when you see them go into the water, they're kind of doing this with their 
digits and their flippers, um, and that's because they have to climb up the ice and use them like claws for that, whereas other species kind of move more like this. So you'll see that difference with harp seals. And then we also have our hooded seals. This is the least common species we see in our area. Um, they're primarily in Canada, sometimes in Maine, but we'll get transfers of hooded seals from our organization in Maine that we work with sometimes. Very aggressive species, the hooded seals. Same with the gray seals. I put that picture on there just to show those teeth. They're born with a pretty full set of teeth. These guys carry zoonotic diseases. So um, just one more reason why we don't want to approach them or get close to them or let our pets get close to them in the field because they can have some nasty bacteria in there. So gray seals, these guys are found in the North Atlantic, Barents in the Baltic Sea. Um, they really live on rocky coastlines, on sandy areas. Males, I put a female and a male on here. So the males are darker in coloration. They have light spots. And then the females are lighter with the darker spots. Um, these are two animals. This is a picture that we uh, took from our, we have a big rehab pool with a window. So these are two seals that were in one of our pools. It was a perfect opportunity to take that photo. But as they get older, they have a really long, broad, flat head. It's said that if you hold a ruler on their nose, it'll touch the whole way down. So they kind of have that horse shape to their head. They get massive. Adults can weigh, males can weigh about 900 pounds. The females are around 600 pounds. Um, and they become sexually mature between four and five years of age. The lifespan of these guys can be anywhere from about 20 to 35 years. So this is actually a famous seal. Did anyone hear about Schubert by chance? That's a story for after. You got to look him up when you guys leave here. But back in the 19th and 20th century, um, these guys, the population was almost completely decimated and wiped out. And that's because there was a bounty placed. So anyone who brought a seal nose to the town hall got $5. So that's a list of how many bounties were claimed. And this, I looked at a research paper that said it was really hard to know exactly how many because some people just didn't report it. But they're estimating anywhere from 72,000 to 135,000. Um, seals were killed um, at that time. So the population was almost completely wiped out. And then in 1972, um, we enacted the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So this is really focused around the word take, so it makes it illegal to disrupt, harass, harm, kill, um, or attempt to do so for any marine mammal, so any whale, dolphin, seal. And due to this, that seal population was actually brought back to a stable level, and the current population estimate in New England is around 50,000 seals. And the Marine Mammal Protection Act is really implemented through three different um, organizations. We have the Department of Commerce, the National Marine Fishery Service, so that's who we work with directly for marine mammals, because those are the marine mammals we'll respond to in our area. We have Fish and Wildlife Service, who was, I mentioned we had to get that emergency permit through for our manatee, because they have jurisdiction over manatees, polar bears, otters. And then we work through the, the Department of Agriculture, um, because we have animals on our, at the aquarium in more of a captive setting. All right, so what do these guys eat? Seals are opportunistic feeders. They're not very picky. They will eat whatever kind of comes their way. Um, and that can be in the form of crustaceans. Sand eels are really port important for their diet um, and nutrition. They eat a lot of those guys. Squid, which I hear is very prevalent right now, right? Of your backyard right here. And then also a variety of fish. And talking to some of my fishermen friends, we have bluefish and mackerel um, who have been um, in the area a lot lately, especially around the North Light here the, over the past month. And then we're preparing for some chub mackerel that's supposed to be in the area soon too. Um, so these are all really fatty fish. So the seals are going to go towards fatty fish because they're not going to have to expend as much energy to hunt and uh, look for food. Um, so they'll eat about 4 to 6% of their body weight per day. Um, on average, I'd say our weaned pups are about 50 pounds. So that's probably like 2.5 pounds or so of fish a day for those little guys. We're growing pretty fast. But why are seals important? So these guys are key stone species in the marine ecosystem, and they really help maintain a balanced food web. It's interesting time to be in this field right now because our climate and the ocean temperatures are changing very rapidly, and we're seeing that firsthand with our strandings. Uh, we're seeing animals in the area, for example, whales that 
um, used to kind of pass through this area, and now they're hanging around a lot more. So we're seeing a lot more vessel strikes with whales, but whales wouldn't be in this area if there weren't food resources for them here. Um, so a lot of the videos that we get of whales, they're actively eating, they look really good, it just puts them at risk for vessel strikes because they're at the surface a lot. Um, but we're kind of seeing all these effects of climate change, different fish in the area, um, fish that might be here longer than normal. So it's all happening really quickly. Um, and so our, our whole ecosystem's a little bit out of whack right now, but we need to wait some, some time for it to kind of balance out. And the seal population, yes, we're seeing more seals in the area, but we're not really sure if it's more just the distribution's changing, is the seal population growing? It's really hard to put a number on the seal population because they're actively swimming, they're moving around, and they're all over the place. Um, so it's hard to put an exact number on what the population is right now. But we do know that they are a very important food source as well. Um, and for other predators, which we'll see around here, it's sharks. Um, I won't get into sharks too much because I know you guys have a really awesome presentation coming later on this summer. We will talk more about the shark stuff. Um, but sharks have always been here. Um, and so they are very much needed to balance out the seal population as well. So nature is going to naturally do that. The seals will eat certain fish that are more abundant as well. Um, and so everything will balance itself out. And seals also, because they're swimming, they help cycle nutrients throughout the water column and from the open ocean to shore as well. So very important species um, to have. What are normal seal behaviors? And I, I'm sure a lot of you know what they are. I just say this because we get a lot of misconceptions. We get a lot of hotline calls about seals that hind legs aren't working. And it can be a little confusing because seals do look very similar to sea lions who we see on the west coast. We don't have sea lions here. Um, seals look very awkward when they move. We call it undulating. They look like an inchworm. Um, they don't really use those hind flippers for anything on land. They're pretty useless, to be honest. They use them in the water. The whole hind end is going to be moved um, for that's how they get their propulsion. But on land, those hind flippers are pretty useless. Um, these guys don't need to eat every day. So people get concerned that the seals out on the beach, um, they might be on the beach for two to three days, which is also normal. They need to rest. These guys dive hundreds of feet. Um, they travel to Greenland in 10 days sometimes. If I did that, I'd want to rest for probably a week if I got here. Um, and so that's what they need to do when they are on land. Um, they don't need to eat every day. They do lay on their side very often. That's something that's of concern, I know, um, for a lot of hotline calls we get, but it's normal for them to lay on their side. They lay on their back, they roll, they yawn, they scratch. Um, they also don't need to be wet every, all the time. So a lot of our seals, like I said, will haul out for days at a time. When we do surgeries on seals in the clinic, a lot of times we can't let that surgical site get wet. We've had seals that um, might be dry for a week. Um, because they just had surgery. So that's totally fine. I mean, we'll still like sprinkle the face with water sometimes, but um, they really don't need to be wet. As long as they're getting food and hydrated, um, then they'll be fine. So what threats do these guys face? This is actually a seal that we rescued from the North Light in April. Uh, but entanglements, that's probably one of the more common things that we're seeing, which I'm going to get into a little bit. Um, illegal taking, illegal killing, Pollution, um, humans, we're doing a lot of harm. Think of all the pesticides that we use and pollutants that we use every single day. And it rains, that runoff water goes to the ocean. Um, it's interesting because we actually have a seal that's in rehab right now with something called Sarcocystis neurona. It's an adult harp seal that we um, found stranded in Newport. And it's a brain parasite, so it affects them neurologically. It's only transmitted from a possum. So we're like, how did this seal get this in Newport in the water? But if you think about the geography, it's pretty flat. Um, so all that runoff water from when it rains heavy goes right to the ocean. But if you think about a parasite that's transmitted through a possum getting to the ocean, how many pollutants and things that we use every day in our yards um, are just going right to the ocean as well. So that's a really great example of what can happen and how it can affect these animals. And we also see some vessel interactions, um, propeller wounds, stuff like that, which is also really important why we don't want to feed these guys. Um, when they come in for rehab, we don't want to, we really don't talk in front of them too much. We have um, sheets and like tarps in front of their units because we don't want them to associate us with fish or food or anything reinforcing. And this is why. We don't want them following vessels. We don't want them following boats. Um, they'll get harmed, and it's just not great um, for them overall. So why do seals come in for rehabilitation? We see lots of different things. Um, these are some of the most common things we see. So illness or disease. 
these guys get influenza, they get a lot of things that we do, they get pneumonia, um, uh, HPAI, so avian influenza is something that we're monitoring. So we'll test every single seal that comes in for rehab, we'll take swabs and test them for these things. Um, maternal abandonment is another common thing, and a lot of that um, it happens from either harbor seal pups um, or young gray seal pups that mom might be, you know, nursing them. She might go out to look for food, and then someone sees a young pup on the beach, they're going to go right up to it, and mom's not going to come back. So, unfortunately, a lot of the maternal abandonment cases that we get are because humans have interacted and approached an animal, so mom's not going to come back. Um, entanglement wounds, like I mentioned, vessel strike wounds, and we are seeing some predation wounds. Coyotes also, if the seal's on the beach at night, sometimes coyotes will um, attack seals as well. And this is what I was talking about, that fluffy lanugo coat. This is what they have when they're born um, to keep them warm during the winter. And when they're born, they're about 30 pounds. After they're done nursing for three to four weeks, they weigh close to 100 to 150 pounds. So they don't need that fluffy coat to keep them warm anymore, but it's white. So the sunlight, it can attract some more heat from the sunlight as well. And just a little behind the scenes, if an animal did have to come in for rehabilitation, a seal, this is where they would come. Um, so these units, they are smaller, but they're small for a reason. We want to be able to fit as many patients as we can in this space. And the goal is not to have them with us for long. We want them in the door, fatten them up, get them healthy, and get them out the door as quick as possible. Um, so we transition them from some of the smaller units on like the top right there is kind of where they come in. They're weaker. They need more handling every day. We'll transition them from those units to these units, one through five, right here. And then that's our pre-release pool, where they'll go about two weeks before release. We do have that blue tarp there, because we will feed our seals behind a tarp, so fish for them falls from the air a lot. Um, it's kind of a funny thing. We've had some interns start, and they, they got to work on their throws. But the, the public side's right on the other side of that pool, so people have gotten hit, public members. Um, with fish from, from the air. Um, and then some of these units here will hide behind doors to toss in fish to them that way. So we really try to limit our contact with them. If we have a long-term seal rehab, like we actually have a seal in one of these pools that's been with us for about a year because it has an eye condition. Um, this is a bigger space for that animal. We know they're gonna be with us longer. Um, so we'll go in here. And if we did have a dolphin candidate for rehab, um, they would go in that space as well. And then we will do absolutely anything and everything we can for the animals that come into our care. Once they come into us, it's our responsibility to really do everything we can. And we have um, some incredible, incredible veterinarians we work with, some vet techs. Um, so this is actually a seal surgery we did a couple weeks ago um, for a seal that actually had very, very heavy netting wrapped around its neck. So this animal could not swim well. Um, which made it very susceptible for prey, predator-prey interactions. So this animal had some significant shark injuries as well. I don't know how she got away with all the heavy netting around her, but she did. She's a very lucky seal. Um, but we um, had to amputate part of her hind flipper because of the extent of those injuries and wounds. Um, so she's doing really well, um, but just kind of goes to show um, the efforts that we put into these animals and making sure that they get the best possible second chance at, at life that they can. And we will always also try to, well, I should say always. So we do um, have some grant funding that we're working with for satellite tags right now, which we're lucky to have because these tags are very expensive. They cost around $4,500 to $6,000 per tag. We will never see this tag again usually. Um, the data that we collect is very important, but the battery life is about three months, if we're lucky. So it's a very short period of data that we get from these tags. Um, the tags don't harm the seal at all. It goes on their fur. We use like an epoxy that, that sets very quickly. Um, and so we'll try to set tag as many animals as we can, and we can tell the depth that they're diving. Um, their location, and how long they're underwater for. So it's really interesting, especially now, with how seal prey species are, with what they're eating, um, learning where they're going, with the water temperature changes, um, and all that stuff. So we're getting some really great data, even though we might not have those tags for a, lot, a long time. Um, the seals also molt once a year. They go through a catastrophic molt. They shed their outer layer of skin and fur. So that tag will fall off of them. Um, so it's not like it's on them. 
Um, and then the goal for every single animal that we bring in for rehabilitation is going to be to release them. On average, like I mentioned, the seals spend about three months in our care. We try to get them out a little quicker. We've um, Luckily, this past year, I think our average is probably closer to two months with getting the seals out the door. But they're, like I said, rehab, it's not meant to be a long-term thing. We really want them in and then out. And this is just a little example. So these are the satellite tags that we've put out so far this year. Um, so you can kind of get an idea. Each animal is a different color. Um, so we had one seal, Schubert, who you guys, if you look him up like you should after this, um, is this green dots right here. Now I'll give you a little backstory on Schubert because I think it's an amazing story. But back in 2015, we had a seal pup come in from Massachusetts that had severe injuries. Um, we merged him back to health, released him in Rhode Island. And then September of last year, I got a call from Noah, which I'm like, okay, anytime Noah calls, something's happening. So usually it's a, a whale, that, a dead whale that washed up on the beach. But this time, it was actually a call saying that there was a very large seal stuck in a pond in Beverly, Massachusetts. And this pond was not near the ocean either. So I was a little confused how the seal got in there. And I was kind of like, well, how, what do you want us to do about it? So we all hopped on a call with different organizations in Massachusetts as well. Um, and basically, for the seal to get to the pond, it had to go, it had to be like a super, super high tide. Um, and the seal had to go through a quarter of a mile long tunnel. And then the tunnel led to some dry ground. The seal had to go up to a small pond. And this is a big industrial area, mind you. Um, and then after it was in the small pond, it had to go up a hill. Um, and then down the hill into a very, very big pond. And so the big pond is called Shoe Pond. The town fell in love with the seal when they found out there was a seal in their pond in the middle of a mall, basically. And so it was like an exhibit. They were all standing around the pond all day long. There was news stations everywhere. And after eight days, Noah was a little concerned because there weren't a lot of food resources in the pond. Also, the seal is an adult seal. Um, they're very aggressive, so it can be dangerous for people, and there's really busy roads and a lot of traffic around. So we went to this pond, which I, once I was there, I heard about it. I'm like, okay, like maybe the seal, I could see how it could have gotten stuck in this pond. But after I got there, I was like, how on earth did this happen? Um, but after eight days, we were like, okay, let's try to figure out how to get the seal out. And the seal made us look very silly. There were news stations everywhere, and the most brilliant idea anyone had was for us to get in a Zodiac with nets, which was like the worst thing we could have done because the seal just made us look very silly. Um, but then we were like, OK, he hauls out at night. So let's go back at 6 in the morning, and we'll leave a kennel already out on the, on the side of the pond. And we could get him. And so I got a call at about 3 or 4 in the morning. The seal made his way through the entire mall parking lot to a police station. It <laughs> showed up at the police station door. And the best part of the whole thing is that Every single store in the mall has security cameras, and they caught footage of him going throughout the entire mall. And you see the police officer open the door, the SEAL sees the police officer, and beelines it the other way, up to a parking garage. So it was a whole thing. We got the SEAL. It ends up being a SEAL that we released in 2015. So it was kind of a cool story because we never really see where our SEALs end up. Um, we get this three months worth of data. We do put a flipper tag on them, but it just has like a unique number on the tag. Um, so it was a really cool case because we actually were like, okay, the seal is, is thriving out there. He might not be the smartest, but he's thriving out there. So this is Schubert. So then we release him on Block Island because we were hoping he'd join the little haul out. And what does he do? He goes directly back to Shoe Pond. The entrance, luckily the water wasn't high enough for him to get in. But we were all like, oh my gosh, no. And then he went down to Delaware and hung out like in this very big industrial like area for about a month. So we were like, you know what? We did what we could. He's on his own at this point. But, <laughs> but it's interesting to see where they go. Um, you know, they'll go up north usually a lot of times, um, New Hampshire, Maine area. Um, so this was a really cool case, I thought. Um, this was actually here on island um, this past March. Uh, but it just shows the collaboration that we have with our responders on island. Also, like the Coast Guard. Um, we had a seal that washed up. It's not the best picture, but the seal was really not very responsive at all, um, in really bad shape. And one of our responders, Jules Cranock, I'm sure a lot of you guys know Jules, 
um, went out there and said, you know, the seal's in great shape. We got to do something. So Jules Kennel's the seal with Fred Leader. And the only thing was it's in the middle of winter, so their ferry schedules are pretty tough. Um, the Coast Guard that we work with is fantastic in New London. Um, when they're slow, they'll use our responses as, as drills a lot of times. So they use, uh, we call the seal Coasty. Um, as a drill. So the Coast Guard came out here. They helped transport Coasty back to the aquarium for us, and that's Coasty on admit. You can see she is not very responsive. She's pretty down and out. This animal had very, very significant high white blood cell count, so a significant infection going on, um, was anemic. Um, you could tell she really didn't have any fur, so alopecia all over her, which isn't a death sentence by any means, but she couldn't regulate her body temperature because she had no fur on her body. Um, sometimes they get alopecia, it could be, we're not really sure why, it could be like a fungal skin infection or it could be stress related. Um, but this is her after, so a couple weeks later right there, you can see she's very malnourished, but at least she looks like she's perking up a bit. And then about a month later, she has her satellite tag and she's ready for release. So um, she was a really great success story with the collaborations that we have out here on island. There's Jules, we're very excited. He opened the kennel, I didn't, couldn't find any pictures of him opening it, but it was great to have him come to the mainland and be able to kind of celebrate that case together. All right, so let's talk a little bit about entanglements on islands. So um, as many, all of you know, our seal population at the North Light seems to be um, growing, and it's a very popular area for them. Um, so this is kind of what we're working with here. So ever since 2018, we've seen an increase in seals out at the North Light. Prior to then, we've seen them pretty much seasonally. They're not really here too much in the summertime. Um, we just see occasional animals out there. Our hotline reports um, of animals called into us was pretty slim that time of year. And then ever since 2018, we've had seals out there all year round. This photo on the right was taken locally um, with a drone, but that is from May last year. And we've counted 273 seals at the North Lake at that time. Um, so it's now become this established haul-out site. Um, the issue that happens with that is that also tourism and the um, activity at the North Lake has increased as well. So with that, we've seen more seal entanglements, which maybe they just weren't reported as much, but I think that there just are a lot more um, entanglements and then also disturbances where people are approaching these animals and disturbing them. I think there's all good intentions, um, but people just don't know the federal laws that protect these animals um, and pro are supposed to prevent people from disrupting the entire population out there. Um, so just to kind of take a look at the numbers we see, this was a seal reported just this month, uh, what, what is it, still June? So yeah, this month, a couple weeks ago that we're trying to get. Um, so we have really never had too many entanglements reported to the hotline prior to 2018. Um, you can see like around seven, eight, nine a year. Those are confirmed cases where we actually see a photo and can say that's a different entanglement than other ones we've seen. But we do get a lot of reports of people saying they see an entangled seal, but they just didn't take a photo. So we don't really know the actual number, but these are confirmed cases that we've received photos of. And you can see so far this year, we're at nine. Um, so we'll probably exceed any other year. I know. Alyssa, who's one of the staff here, said that she saw a new entanglement this morning out there, potentially. So um, it's just a matter of getting eyes out there and being able to count everything. But a lot of what we're seeing are these kind of twine, which can be really difficult to see because the tie is um, on the bottom of the neck. So when the animal's moving, you don't really see that. Um, so there are potentially a lot of entangle entanglement cases that we don't see out there. But with entanglements, we face a lot of challenges. And it can be very frustrating because I know when people call the hotline and if I was seeing an entangled animal, you want to get that animal disentangled and it's frustrating if you can't right away. But the geography of the North Light, logistics, and just being able to monitor frequently has been a challenge for us. Um, I'm gonna, Jules is not here tonight. He was supposed to be, but he's in Nova Scotia, so I'm throwing him under the bus a little bit. Um, but he is amazing because he will help us and take supplies out there for us. He'll transport animals for us. So we are so very grateful for Jules. And the only time, you know, stranding's always an adventure. I have gotten trucks stuck before for sure, but it's funny because the only time um, I brought our intern out there recently, it's the first time Jules got stuck. But um, 
we have challenges because we have to drive to the ferry, which is about an hour drive for us, and catch an hour ferry over here, and then get you know the mile hike down to the North Light. And these are active animals. Just because they're entangled doesn't mean they're debilitated. Um, they're definitely young animals that are growing, and so that's the most um, disheartening part of it is that they're growing so quickly that that entanglement's going to become a lot worse very quickly. So we do kind of have time on our on our hands a little bit with that, but um, but it can be challenging just getting access to these animals within you know an hour or so. So that's been one challenge. Also, just monitoring them um, with so many animals out there. The circle is where there's an entangled seal. Um, but it's really hard because they're close to the water. They're also near a lot of other seals, so we can't just go up and get the disentangled seal because we're going to disrupt the entire um, haul out. So we often see them with our binoculars, but we have to kind of sit, and it's a game of patience and waiting for them to kind of come away from the rest of the group, which takes a lot of time and a lot of resources for that as well. And then our other challenge, like I mentioned, is the human disturbances. We do get a lot of people calling our hotline saying that, they saw people approach seals and they wanted to, you know, they don't know how to keep people away. Um, we've thought about potentially putting um, like stakes and rope up at the North Light, but it's always hard because the tide can wash them out completely if there's a really high tide. So it's a tricky, tricky area to really work with. But I will say we've had more success over the past couple of years and we're very, have some really exciting things coming up in the future um, that we're really looking forward to. And one of those things is our increased monitoring. So we're having either first responders, I'm going to talk a little bit about an internship collaboration that we have. So getting the increased eyes out there, um, so we're able to catch those animals when they do stray away from the group. And that's what happened in April. Um, Val and I and Jules and Alyssa went out to the North Light um, to look to see if there were any entangled seals. And we happened to see one. It was kind of foggy, so hard to tell, but you can really see the indentation from the top of that entanglement is what caught our eye. And we were able to, it's, it's not easy. You don't want to just run up to the seal because they're going to just go right into the water. So it's a game of patience and kind of sneaking up on them when they give you that second and look away or something like that. But we were able to get them, which was really exciting. So every, every little success we we find you know, a huge victory with it just because it is such a challenging thing to get. But this animal was brought in. Um, we did clean that wound and give them some um, antibiotics. And once we give an animal antibiotics, they have to stay with us for two weeks. Um, so that entire medication and antibiotics are out of their system before we release them. And that's a federal requirement. Um, so it's always this toss up. Um, if they need antibiotics or not, because we could just turn them around and release them. But this guy did have a pretty significant infection, so he did receive antibiotics and was released two weeks later. Um, we're also doing some advanced uh, first responder training. Um, and so that one thing that we have found success um, for some of our responders who have been with our program for a while, for a while they are able to kennel seals for us. So instead of us taking the drive to the ferry, the ferry out here, if they find a seal at the North Light, they have kennels and supplies staged on island now and are able to just kennel the seal for us and put the seal on the ferry, um, which we're so grateful for the ferry folks um, because they've been wonderful and so helpful with this new kind of method that we have. And then we're able to take a look and do an exam on the seal on the other side of the mainland. But that's been the most successful for us. So kind of a new technique we've, we've had. Um, hopefully, we're hoping to implement some drones for population counts and surveys and also extended monitoring in the future. Um, also, potentially having UTVs or ATVs, we're able to get out there a lot quicker and easier. Um, we don't want to get Jules's uh, Wrangler stuck out there too much more. Um, and then building those relationships within the fishing community. Um, we're trying to get some funding to purchase more biodegradable materials that fishers can use. Um, instead of some of the more like plasticky materials. Um, and then some intern projects we might have are looking at how to develop new kind of bait bags that prevent seals from getting in there as well. And then um, increasing our presence in signage on island as well. And um, we do have some gear stored in one of the bunkers um, at the North Lights. So we're able to use those more frequently if we need it. Um, and just having our staff out here on island is one of our plans for the future and moving forward is just to help increase that monitoring and presence to help educate the public as well while we're out there um, and answer any questions that we have. 
So here's our intern. Sorry, Sophia, she's in the back. Um, so we have a really fantastic internship collaboration. This is our pilot summer. Um, but thanks to Val and everyone at Vimy, we're really excited for this. So our intern um, is here now. She's been coming out here um, this past month and will continue throughout the summer. Um, and then Val has a staff um, intern, previous intern, Alyssa, um, who's also fantastic. Alyssa's been coming to the clinic and learning more about what we do with the program so she can help educate the people um, in public here. Um, so it's a really great collaboration, and we're really hoping that this is going to help with some of the response, help answer questions for the public, and mitigate that disturbance that we're seeing at the North Light. Um, also, one thing that we're really trying to do is put this sign up there um, on a pretty regular basis, rope and stakes, to help create a barrier so people aren't approaching um, the seals and wildlife as often. And then I said this is off-road training. So all of us girls helped dig jewels out the other day. Um, so that's part of our new training as well, is just getting really dirty, which Sophia did fantastically. The seaweed was probably the worst smelling seaweed I've ever smelled, and she had it all over her. Um, but yeah, we had, we had a lot of fun that day. It's always an adventure. And one other exciting thing I'm just going to put a little plug in for, which you guys can hear more when John Dodd, John Dodd from Atlantic Shark Institute comes. Um, but we're going to be doing a research collaboration with Bimmy. Um, us at Mystic, Rhode Island DEM, and Atlantic Shark Institute. Um, and it's really to learn more about the seal population and any shark interactions that are happening. Uh, because right now the sharks um, are really passing by the south side of the island and they're going to Cape Cod because that's where they're going to get more bang for their buck in terms of food resources. At least a lot of the um, older sharks are doing that. Um, but what is the seal population going to take around here for sharks to either stick around more often? Um, and what does that interaction look like? And what's, what's our seal population doing? Because it's very new for us that we're seeing seals here all year round. But we've never really done regular population counts on the seals as well. So that's something that we want to do to kind of get that baseline population count and see if it's increasing over the years and how it's changing. Um, it's a really unique opportunity. Um, and location that we have here on Block Island where we are seeing this growth and um, is it just more of a change in distribution or is it actually a rise in the population? So that's something that we're really looking to find out and see what the main food resources are for seals in this area um, and how that's changing um, over the years. So we're looking forward to that. All right. Any questions? Yeah. It's declined. Mm -hmm. What kind of? Um, well, it's hard to say. So, yeah, sorry. So, the question was, what's your name, sir? What was your name? Isaac. So, Isaac fishes around here for many, many years. Um, and he said that the fish population seems to be declining and is asking if it um, makes sense that the seal population would be contributing to that. And my question for you is what species of fish do you want primarily? Striper? That they're eating the bait fish that the stripers come for. Yeah, I, I can't say for sure. I will say that I talk to and try to do my due, dilig due diligence in like research and talking to fishermen in um, our area and like Stonington area. Um, we work closely with lobster fishermen because we give them a lot of our bait that we, our fish that we don't use um, at the end of the day to feed our seals. We give it to them for bait fish. Um, 
they also mentioned they i thought they had mentioned at least in that area that the striper population was booming this was like a year or two ago um the lobster population was declining um and they thought that the striper were eating a lot of the juvenile lobsters but i don't know so i don't it's hard yeah it's hard to say because the the ocean temperatures like the whole ecosystem is changing so much uh it's hard to say we're seeing you know different fish species in the area longer than they used to be and maybe the striper populations shifted a little bit because of ocean temperatures and their prey might not be um, in this area anymore i'm not saying seals i'm sure are eating some of the fish but i wouldn't say that the seal is the primary reason for the decline just with all the changes in the ecosystem and I don't know if we'll really know what the effects are for you know a couple more years or why things are happening. Um, but it's it's hard to put like pinpoint a certain thing. Like it's definitely the seals when everything's changing so quickly, um, and that's what we're seeing. You know, with a lot of you know the animals that we're seeing in our coverage area, we're seeing malnourishment in a lot of our animals as well. So um, yeah, it's really hard to say. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's a lot of that like white twine that um, was on there. So yeah, we see some like gill nets, but um, we also see like a lot of that like just plain white like twine, essentially. That, um, um, we have some ideas for where it's coming from, which is why we're trying to get more biodegradable um, materials. Um, I think it's a cheap, cheap option. Um, and when you're trying to make money, you're going to go with the cheaper, cheaper option. Um, so yeah, so we're working to try to get more biodegradable materials out there. We, um, we, oh, sorry. Yes. Do we work closely with the Nature Conservancy and their seal counts? Um, I do know that we have spoken with them before because I think they were doing summer population counts at one point and some of, one of their staff were a responder with us for a bit. Um, but I should talk to them more because I don't know how they're doing their population counts exactly um, and how frequently they, they do them. But I, I know that they had a student at one point who was doing them on a regular basis. I don't know if anyone here knows how often they do counts. Barb. You know. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to. Okay. It's every other week. Nice. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Great to know. I'd love to see some of your data. Yeah. In the back. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, for sure. That's a good question. So yeah, if you if you're in the water and a seal approaches you, um, I would say, yeah, I mean, they're approaching you, so um, it's not like you're disturbing them, but I would definitely try to remove yourself from the situation and get out of the water. They can be aggressive, especially during times of year, if it's like mating or breeding season, um, that can make them more aggressive um, as well. So for your safety and the animal safety, um, just kind of take a step back and definitely give us a call because we um, could send a responder out there and at least put some signage up or have responders chat with the pup. Yeah, I know. Well, I went out to the North Light recently and they were like all popping up at the water just kind of staring at us. Um, so they do seem to be pretty curious. But um, yeah, so not like you're doing anything wrong because they're approaching you, but definitely keeping a distance um, is the safest thing. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, so why do the antibiotics have to be fully fleshed out before we release them? Um, so they're, we're not 
basically putting antibiotics into the environment. So if the animal were to defecate or something like that um, and making um, you know, more resistant uh, bacteria out there. And then also if, for example, I don't know, if like a shark ate a seal and then somebody consumed that, that animal, then um, that would be bad for them as well. So it's kind of just making sure that it's out of the environment and not able to be consumed by anybody. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Really? Oh, see, I haven't heard of them as much on Scotch Beach, so that's interesting. Really? It's his routine. I wonder. Maybe there's some ladies over there who he likes to go check on. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. The mother abandoned, as you said, the baby seal's left on the baby. The person may come up and touch the seal. Does the mother pop out of the water and say, hey, my, my baby's hanging out with people? Does she smell it? What, what causes the mother to abandon? Yeah, that's a good question. So, what causes a mother to abandon a seal? Is it like a scent if someone touches a seal? Um, it's really, they're, they get spooked pretty easily. Even gray seals are pretty aggressive, but they don't have, like, birds will, like, dive bomb you sometimes. Seals won't do that. Um, they, they just get spooked and they, they go away, it seems like. Um, it's not a scent thing, though. Um, it's more, I know, like, in other areas see this worse um, within our network that we hear from, but people will, like, actually pick an animal up and either bring them home or stuff like that. Luckily, we don't see that too much here. Um, but it's more so just like people, huddle, you know, huddled around an animal and then mom kind of just takes off and doesn't always come back. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for having me and for all you do for the animals out here. That was wonderful. So just a couple of notes. Next week, we do not have a talk because of 4th of July. But two weeks from tonight, Ben Ruska will be here talking about some Block Island history. And three weeks from tonight, we'll have a woman who sailed for several months in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and studied it. The patch, yeah, uh, Erica Serino, and she, uh, she wrote a book about it. So anyway, we'll see you in a couple of weeks and then hopefully every week after. Thank you so much.